Welcome to Looking at Legal Stuff. Today we have six hearings in a case where mom wants to change the parenting plan to give dad less residential time just because their son refuses to go. Dad wants mom held to contempt for intentionally withholding the child and involving their son in the court process. Let's see what the commissioner thinks. All right, uh, Mr. Sorensen, can you hear me? Yeah. Okay. Phone seems to be working a lot better and it's much more clear. So we, all, I'm ready to hear you know, your comments related to your motion of uh, for contempt. Your Honor, I'm here today to hold Ms. Fike in contempt and regain my residential schedule with my son. As you can see from the filed statements, what I have filed and asking for. The parenting plan was not obeyed by the mother and the violations are as follows. Did not follow the residential schedule in section eight, paragraph B. I was denied visitation on 625, 626, and 77. Ms. Fike disparaged the parent myself in front of the child, which occurred on 625 pickup day, which violates section 14 paragraph restrictions in the parenting plan, where she discussed adult issue matters, badmouthed me and my wife and slandered me, used profanity towards me, refused my visitation, and kicked me off her property in front of our son. She asked the child involved in to make decisions or requests involving the residential schedule with which violates section 14 paragraph restrictions. Ms. Fike and our son clearly discussed changing the residential plan. Ms. Fike requests our son to discuss and to make a decision on attending visitation where he chose not to. She discussed changing the residential schedule with our child outside of already agreed plans, which violates section 14 paragraph restrictions. She encouraged the child, it was his choice, to change his primary residence and his choice whether or not he attends, which violates section 14 and the paragraph restrictions. She did not construct a regular and consistent responsiveness and cooperation during refusal of visitation, which also violates the section 14 with restrictions. Tiffany did not attempt to reach me in any way on June 25th to discuss, resolve, or inform me of any disruptions to the schedule, even after being instructed to do so by LPD. She tells my child he does not have to attend visitation, that she is not going to make him, goes and files a plan for supervised visits, and tells me he should stay with her until the 20th. Then, after being informed of contempt, states she can't physically make him go. That contradicts all her claims and she, that she is following the parenting plan and keeping him from me. Ms. Fike did not notify me prior to pick up to inform me of Christopher's refusal. She had hours to do so and did not. She also did not discuss any resolutions with me, asked me for to get help Christopher to, to, to attend, did not ask the police to enforce her help, did not ask me to attend a conversation at pickup time. Instead, she had Christopher contact me, inform me he was not attending visitation four hours before visitation was to occur. She had plenty of time to contact me during the four hours before pickup time to occur and didn't. I attempted to contact Ms. Fike and she denied both phone calls, which puts our child in decision-making. I had no choice but to contact LPD for help. LPD then contacted Ms. Fike when she answered for them, and she was instructed to follow the parenting plan and to make sure my son came home and was also instructed to contact me. Neither one occurred. Ms. Fike never made contact with me. After being informed by Christopher he was not to attend visitation and speaking with LPD, I attempted to pick Christopher up that evening. I was met at the door with Tiffany trying to facilitate an ambush against me in front of my son and coach Christopher, not once telling Christopher he is to attend visitation and go with me or to get in the car, which should have been the only issue we were discussing. Instead, she was allowing my son to tell me he is not attending and he shouldn't have to with his mother in agreeance. That is, that she's not going to make him. Christopher was disrespect me and defying my wishes to get in the car. She also instructed me to read a letter Christopher wrote to the courts, not to me, but to the courts. I read the first few lines and it was talking ill about me and my wife and tired of having to obey our rules, again, placing him in the middle of involving him in court decisions. She wanted to control the narrative and shame and slander me in front of our son. It was in a non-constructive environment, not suitable for any discussion. I ended up being told by Ms. Fike to get off her property and to leave without my son. I tried the following day to get Christopher and was met again with texts from Christopher that he is not attending. I tried calling Ms. Fike, who did not answer, and received texts that she is not going to make him. I tried to regain my visitation on the, the second week I was to have Christopher. I set up counseling for him to attend and tried to contact Ms. Fike that Christopher needs to attend visitation. She did not want to hear anything about it. She refused communication about second visitation to start on 7-7.
I did not in any way approach Ms. Fight combatively or maliciously. I simply informed her Christopher needs to come home, attend counseling, and offered a non-conflict way to get him home. She ignored my text. The following day, however, she threatened harassment charges on me if I were to continue talking about receiving my son. She told me we needed to wait for court and that Christopher should remain with her until then. I contacted LPD, who tried to get Ms. Fike again to follow through with the parenting plan, mentioning multiple times it's in her best interest to do everything possible to follow the parenting plan, and she told them as well she was not going to force Christopher to go. LPD then instructed me to continue with the contempt. She supports any and all alienation of involvement and sees no issue with it at all. Ms. Fike, in the midst of this, used her personal server, be that of her mother, Jill Hall, the grandmother of Christopher, who for the better half of three years, it was ordered by the courts she does not be around Christopher until she can attend drug counseling and pass a hair follicle test, since she is a known drug addict and has placed Christopher in danger in the past. A woman who is not allowed around my son should not be allowed on my property or near my family. Jill Hall came to my residence twice, both times relentlessly banging on my door and ringing the doorbell for over five minutes at a time. Jill Hall is a very dangerous and unpredictable individual that should not be involved in this situation or around in any form. I told Jill Hall when I retrieved the papers to not come back to my property, where she then screamed, you've been served. Ms. Fike utilizing her mother in this situation is very concerning and puts our family in danger, which only solidifies malicious intent. The constant problem at hand is Christopher feeling pressured and coached to evade my house. He is discouraged from loving myself or a lifelong bonus mom. Christopher voices this time and time again and asks for help on the issue. Every two to three years, Tiffany tries to find ways to manipulate the courts and change the schedule, use baseless false accusations to attain that. This case is consistent with the previous ones. Christopher displays the same antics at our house. However, it is handled appropriately. Christopher voices major and concerning issues about his mother's home weekly. So we utilize the school counselor when he has an issue. We set up a meeting there to discuss it. We don't ambush Ms. Fike or harass her via text, name call, disrespect, or make Christopher feel he has to choose. We pick a professional setting suitable for all parties involved. Your Honor, Christopher refuses. He does not want to attend his mother's visitation almost every week and voices concerns on Fridays. However, we encourage him to spend time with his mother, tell him he is to attend. We run through problem solving, give him problem solving tips. We do not keep him home from her or make him choose to involve him in the court matters that are trauma causing. We always try to facilitate a constructive in-house resolution without slandering Tiffany or causing Christopher to fill in the middle. I myself initiated and asked the court's last custody case to hire a GAL to help with the ongoing issue. I knew involving a professional who works to find the truth would, and she did. Rhonda Larson did an amazing job. She is also available to call on as she is still on our case. I also have been working with the school counselor and Christopher about this exact problem Christopher has with his mother making him to choose sides, lying about my wife and myself making false allegations. I also attained an outside counselor outlet for Christopher through the school counselor to help with these issues at Northwest Psychology. I cannot comprehend how Ms. Fike thinks complete annihilation of our family is a good plan. She feels the need to constantly destroy me, my wife's relationship and family. She uses Christopher in order to do so, not realizing she's destroying him in the process. Christopher has been forced by his mother to write letters, make false claims and statements about my family, which I know fills Christopher with guilt and embarrassment as he states, a time my son should have been spending with myself, attending youth group, Christ for the court basketball camp, collecting his volunteer hours for high school, we have scheduled on our time, attending his job he acquired, family vacations, two of which were canceled due to these circumstances, missing his sister. Instead, he spent a better portion of almost a month away from me with no communication at all, under the impression he is prepared to take his father to court. Stressed, sad, and unequivocally involved in adult matters, no child should. My son has never gone three days without talking to me or seven days without seeing me in his entire life. While I've been dedicated to following the instructions of the court and parenting plan, Ms. Fike has been creating an environment of paranoia and fear for Christopher taking him away from his family and discouraged disregarding the instructions set forth by the courts and law enforcement. I'm asking the courts to bring my son home immediately for the lost time to be awarded, where he needs to attend counseling, get back into his schedule loss, and attend his youth group, prepare for school coming up. He desperately thrives on this schedule that has been robbed. I would like Ms. Fike held accountable so this situation is to never occur again. Thank you.
Okay, thank you, Mr. Sorensen. All right, Ms. Fike, I'll hear your response in, related, in relation to the motion for contempt, please. Yes. So, like you said, this is my third attempt to change the parenting plan. Well, three years ago, my son threatened to run away. He threatened to run away from his dad's house multiple times due to mental and emotional abuse from his dad and stepmom, and more so physical as, you know, Mariah has pushed Christopher before. Um, the reason why I've put this motion in place because Sunday, June 25th, we got home from my sister's house. It was my nephew's birthday party. He was to go to his dad's at 8 p.m. At 6 p.m. that night, he comes to me or calls me into his room and says, Mom, what would happen if I refused to go to my dad's house? Is he muted? Um, what would happen if my mom or if I refused to go to my dad's house? I told them, I'm not sure what would happen, but why don't you want to go to your dad's? Like I said, this was 6 p.m. It was two hours before he would have went to his dad's house. I'm talking to him about it, why he doesn't want to go to his dad's. He says the same reason for years. He said he was in, in the middle of writing a letter to the courts. I did not persuade him. This was this came out of nowhere that he refused and wants to write a letter to the courts. I, did I submit that letter? I did not submit that letter. He wanted his dad to read it because everything on there pinpoints the majority of what's been going on and how he feels about it. My son is mentally and emotionally abused over there daily. He's never wanted to go to his dad's house. He has blatantly said it every single week, but this is the first time he's actually refused to go. I told him I'm not going to make him, but that he needs to go. I feel like he does, but in the back of my mind, from what's been happening over the years that nobody's been listening. Like, I feel like this, like I said in my de declaration, this is his final cry for help. I'm hoping he wants to talk to you, the judge. He, he wants his voice heard, not what, because the back and forth thing, what he, Christopher says at his dad's house and what Christopher says here, like somebody else needs to be that middleman. And as of counseling, I didn't hear about him putting him into counseling until, let's say, I didn't get served with his papers till the 4th of July. And that's when I read that he had an appointment at Northwest Psychological, which we both should have been informed on that as well. And then the next day on July 5th, Chris or Joseph texted me and said that Christopher will be going to that appointment, that he made this appointment, this and that. Well, I already also made him an appointment at Core Health. He has an appointment on August 1st at 1 p.m. Christopher filled out the intake. Christopher filled out all the questionnaires as it's his counseling session. And he turned it in. So my question is, why... Or how did he get that appointment with psychological without telling or talking to Christopher about or having Christopher fill out the child intake? Because that's what that other courthouse says. You know, it's for him since he's over the age of 13. Teens have a little bit more rights than parents know of. And I said, OK, that makes more sense. So I read the child and intake form that would have been filled out for psychological. And one of the questions were. For you as a parent, why do you think that your son needs counseling? Well, I'm not sure what they put on that piece of paper, but my son is refusing to go to his dad's house. So whatever they put on that paper is what they're telling you. So my thought is Northwest Psychological already has a different version of what Christopher's really going through because his dad wrote whatever he did on that paper. The intake that Christopher filled out for core health is all of his words, all of his answers, all of everything for Christopher. I didn't even read it. I just took him to turn it in. Like all that is, I didn't read it because I want people to realize I'm not the one making him do this. I'm not the one bringing court into him. I'm not the one who's bringing any of that up. Christopher is pretty much fed up. And what happened at the airport after his, um, sorry, his DC trip, with his stepmom, I think that might have been the last straw because uh, it's it's just it's just too much. I'm really hoping that somebody's actually gonna listen. It's not me holding Christopher away from his dad. It's Christopher refusing to go. As my part, yes, I should force him. I'm not gonna physically force my son to go somewhere where he's not safe. 
or does it feel safe until somebody else says so, which I feel counseling is going to make that tremendous leap and or talking to the judge or getting that input because Christopher is suffering. He's almost 15 years old. We've been going back and forth the court since he was little because of everything Christopher has told me and everything I've written is what my son tells me. I believe him 100%. 100%, regardless of what people say that he's embellishing stories to get the parents to believe what they want to believe. That is ridiculous because he's still refusing to go. With Joe saying that they haven't been any contact, Christopher has a phone. He hasn't even tried to contact his son to even ask him why he doesn't want to go. He still hasn't asked him why. He could have put that effort into talking to his son too because he has a phone. But regardless, I've never ignored his text messages. All the police says their advice is, is to go with the parenting plan. And I told them I was doing that as best as I can. 6 p.m. is when Christopher brought that up to me about refusing to go to his dad's. I get a call from LPD by 6.20 because Christopher also says, oh, and I, and I text my dad I wasn't going. I never told him to text his dad. He did that all on his own. 6.20, no, six around that time, Joe calls me. I didn't answer because I was in the middle of a discussion with my son trying to figure out why he doesn't want to go because he had till 8 p.m. to go. So I'm trying to talk to my son. So then he calls the police and says, I'm not responding. So the police call and I explained to the officer, yes, that I didn't answer his phone call because I'm in the middle of talking to my son about why he doesn't want to go to his dad's house. So that shouldn't be put on me because I didn't answer his phone call. I'm trying to get down to the bottom of it. And he just, <sighs> nobody's listening. I don't know. When he came over after, you know, came Christopher saying not going, Joe shows up around 7.55 that evening demanding Christopher to come out. Christopher sitting on the chair. He would not come out of the house. I'm like, Christopher, you need to get up. Christopher, you need to come talk to your dad. It took my husband telling him, you know, Christopher, you need to get up. Go talk to your dad. He got up, went to the door. Did want Christopher to read that, or Joseph to read that letter that he did write. He did admit to the police that he only read the first sentence or two, and nothing was slandering or anything about anybody. He didn't even get to read the letter. And with my mother, who's, yes, been three years since she was, three years ago, Joe and Mariah brought my mother up in our custody case for some weird reason, because my son and my mom are inseparable, were in, inseparable. Um, my thought is they brought my mom up into my court case because they didn't have anything to go against me. Long story short, Judge Basher ordered for her not to see my son in person. They can still contact FaceTime and talk on the phone until she does what she was supposed to do, which I did submit the, um, hair follicle tests and stuff too. I'm hoping to address that at this court date as well. Um, my mother has always been the person who serves for me. It's, it has nothing to do with my malicious intent because I don't have anybody else willing to go over there because of how they are. And my mom's the only one willing to do it and I need to serve. And I'm not going to pay 40 bucks for a sheriff to do it because that's ridiculous. Um, my mom banging on their door five, 10 minutes at a time. That's because you're not answering and she's trying to serve you papers. <sighs> Long story short, everybody is trying to pinpoint all this on me when I hope people open their eyes and realize my son is, is in not a very good place. He's very sad. He's depressed. He wants people to listen. He's tired of nobody hearing his story. All right. Thank you, Ms. Mike. I appreciate your input. Um, what, what I'd like to do now, um, I want to hear from each party on the, the motion to modify and the motion to for adequate cause that brought has been brought by Ms. Fike. So Ms. Fike, if you want to address your motion, then I'll hear from Mr. Sorensen, and then I'll give you a ruling on both motions. Ms. Fike? Yes. My order on adequate cause, let me find my paper. has with my son refusing visitation at his father's home he's tired of nobody listening um he's scared he uses the word scared he doesn't want to go to his father's house um 
I feel like either limited time or supervised visitation needs to happen until a counselor or somebody can actually open up their mind to listen to an actual 14 year old. <sighs> I don't know. Okay, any, any additional input uh, other than the, the pleadings and then those comments that you've made there? No, I mean, I'm sure there is. I'm just, there's a lot drawing a blank and I apologize. Okay, it's okay. I, I, re I read your pleadings and I read Mr. Sorensen's pleadings. So, Mr. Sorensen, I don't hear from you on the, the motion for adequate cause and modification of the parenting plan. Um. Well, cons as right now, I am... Um, in the middle of trying to seek counsel for that. I um, I have a meeting on the 15th, it was the soonest that I could get in to talk to account to counseling about or to um, an attorney about if I need to acquire an attorney for that or not. Yeah, the motion is properly noted for today and we're hearing the motion today. Okay, um, and then can I, can I go back as far as um, the counseling that I have set up for him on the 26th? You can touch, I did on, not, that. You can touch on that briefly, go ahead. I did not. Um, I did not give give an intake. The appointment for the twenty six is for Christopher to go there to do the intake. I, I didn't answer any questions or anything. I just simply I made the import the um, appointment for him to go to there to do the intake. So I just want to make that clear that I didn't answer any questions for Christopher or spoke for Christopher. I just simply made the appointment for him to go and to do to to do the intake himself. Thanks. Okay. Do you want to address the motion for adequate cause and modification? Um, as far as far as the the adequate causes, I I feel that this has been and this has kind of been an ongoing thing as as I stated in in my statement for the the contempt. I mean, I've I've hired a, G, a GAL. The GAL has you. I if you've you said you've read through it, so you've read what her report. Um, we're kind of running into that same thing to where Christopher is is playing both both sides. So, so just so you're aware, Mr. Sorensen, I did not read all 222 file documents in the in the file. I read okay. all applicable and relevant motions uh, related to the two motions today. So I see that Ms. Larson filed the guardian ad litem report back in January of 2020. I have not yeah. reviewed that. Okay. Um, she she had found um, what her findings were is everything that I'm that I'm stating that um, Christopher was found to be to have to choose sides over at his mother's house and that he is involved in um, adult conversations and in these court matters. Um, I, I feel like, I mean, we, that's all we have is Christopher's best interest. And right now um, I have a lot of rules. I mean, I hold him accountable and he gets a, away with a lot more at his mother's. So um, it's kind of Disneyland versus um, somebody that has, you know, I have rules. Okay. All right. Thank you. Okay. Um, so at the outset, it's, you know, Christopher is, uh, he's uh, at a really interesting age. He's 14 and sounds like he's almost 15 years old. And that's a, it's a, it's a tough place to be as a teenager. Number one, it's a tough place to be for a teenager in bet caught between two homes uh, with different parenting styles. It sounds like, and different approaches to, to parenting. Um, so here, the motion is brought by Mr. Sorensen for a motion uh, for contempt related to the June 25th visitation. The parenting plan calls for a 50-50 plan, roughly, well, it's a 50-50 plan with exchanges on Fridays. It sounds like the parties have kind of modified that a little bit to make it easier on them for whatever reason. So that's the motion. Uh, the indication is that uh, Mr. Sorensen indicates that there was... Um, that there was a refusal of Christopher to come to the visit. There's an indication by Ms. Fike that Christopher had has some thoughts about uh, what's happening, what he wants and what he doesn't want. And there was an indication that there was not uh, a clear push or edict, if you will, or direction from Ms. Fike that he needed to go with his dad. Uh, her, her focus tended to be more on, on listening to what he had to say. Uh, Dad's focus seemed to be more on there's a parenting plan and we need to uh, follow that. 
So these situations are, are challenging because both parties have a lot of a lot to say, uh, and I think that was noted by the the variety of pleadings that were filed by the parties. And there's a lot of information that needs to be uh, heard. So the the issue is that there's a parenting plan. The parenting plan says it's a 50-50 plan. Life is not static. Children change, parents change, and and the the court system is kind of slow, slow to change. We're not the most nimble nimble of organizations. And so when there's a change, there's a feeling of immediacy. We need to make a change quickly. Uh, it's and you know things may be, may have been brewing for some time with Christopher. And maybe may have been thinking about some things for a long time, but it kind of came to head on this June twenty fifth date. The difficult part is is accommodating that and accommodating the the parenting plan. And there's kind of a natural tension there. So what needs to happen is that there's a, a court order. The court order controls. Uh, the parties have been unable to come to an agreement themselves, and so they've turned it over to a third party, the court. Uh, to resolve and guide the issue. So the court said uh, those parenting plan ne needs to be followed and the parents are to uh, make sure that that it happens. And 15 year olds, certainly you can't pick up a 15 year old and or 14 year old and pick them up and put them in a car. Not gonna happen and, and would be inadvisable. There's other ways to persuade and encourage. Um, and so I will make a finding of contempt. Uh, I think there was a, a clear indication whether it was stated explicitly, I think it was the implicit message was clear. I'm not forcing you. Uh, you don't have to go. Uh, I don't think those words were specifically said, but I think the message came across clearly to Christopher uh, that he did not need to go. And it was more important that his uh, father engage with him, listen to him. You know, and the parenting plan indicates that uh, when I looked at that earlier today under, under paragraph 14, it says the following. I think this is important to note. where it states each parent agrees to encourage the child to directly discuss with the parent in question any grievance they may have with that parent. I think that's uh, that was appropriate. Ms. Fike indicated that Christopher had written a letter and he had wanted to share that with his, his dad. And it sounded like she encouraged uh, Mr. Sorensen to speak to his son about that issue. Uh, it, it also indicates it's the intent of both parties to encourage a direct child-parent bond of communication. Uh, so that's there. So what I'm going to do, I'm going to impose a $100 civil penalty that, that contempt can be purged by following the parenting plan for six months or until there's a change in visitation. So I also think, and, and both parties recognize this, that uh, Christopher needs uh, support, some support through counseling. Sounds like both parties are cognizant of that and working towards that end. That's encouraging and good. Um, and both parents can provide uh, input to uh, the, the counselor for the benefit of the child. So there's two counselors. Um, I don't know if I need to rule on which one's going to, which counselor is going to go, who, who Christopher is going to uh, attend with. A lot of counselors, you know, it, it's it's a personality fit. And sometimes it's you meet with one counselor and it's just, it's not a good fit. So I'm going to leave it to the parties to figure out which counselor but he goes to, but the, he needs to be seen by a counselor. He needs to have that outlet. I'm also uh, I'm also going to order this because I think both, both parents here have a lot of information to share, and there's a lot bottled up that uh, just needs to come out. Uh, so I think uh, I'm going to require both Mr. F uh, Sorensen and Ms. Fike to engage themselves with the counselor for at least three sessions to discuss how your actions uh, contribute to the situation. It's going to be a self-focus, self-reflective uh, to better determine uh, how you are contributing to, to the issue. Um, I'm also going to require, I'm, I'm going to appoint a guardian ad litem. Uh, so the guardian ad litem can uh, interview uh, and speak with Christopher so his voice can be heard. And then both parents can have their opportunity to, to be heard also. That guardian ad litem's duty is simply that, to, to address the issue uh, of a 14, almost 15-year-old boy as far as residence, res residential schedule. That's that's the, the sole focus. Um, and it, to make clear that the uh, Christopher is not allowed to make the decision of where he goes. He's required to go as the parenting plan requires. 
and he should be disavowed disavowed of that false notion. It's gonna it's gonna be a lot slower than a fourteen year old child wants things to happen. Uh, but we're gonna get input from the guardian ad litem. He'll have an out, output with the counselor. Both parents will have opportunity to be do some self reflection under the guidance of a counselor to see how they're contributing to to the issue because it doesn't happen in a vacuum. Um, so, and sometimes it's hard to see that without the professional help. So that's the, the contempt motion. As far as the motion to modify uh, and the motion for adequate cause, I'm, I, I'm making a finding that there is not adequate cause at this point. Uh, so I'm denying the motion for adequate cause and denying the motion to modify the parenting plan. So with that said, I'll ask the parties if you have, have any questions or clarifications of the court's ruling. Um, as far as my lost, my lost time of the two weeks that I missed out on, is that just should chalk that up as... Yeah, good question. I, I I thought about that, and I think under the the current circum circumstances, I'm going to let that ride. I'm not going to order makeup time. I, I am I am requiring that the parenting plan pick up this Friday at the Friday or, or whatever. If it sounds like it was Sunday, maybe what the parties had kind of agreed on. But the the parenting plan, if the parties can't agree, it'll be Friday at 5 p.m. That's when the exchange needs to occur. If the parties had had been doing a different schedule, you're free to do that, but it has to happen this weekend. Uh, no. Um, the, the 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 exchange needs to occur. Okay. Ms. Fike, do you have any any questions or points of clarification? No, not at this time. Well, actually, when when will we hear about the guardian ad litem? Yeah, thanks. Um, so I, I'm going to ask the guardian ad litem to do an accelerated review uh, with a review in 30 days. Is is my hope. Uh, and for guardian ad litem, that's a pretty quick turnaround time, and we'll have a hearing in, in, in roughly 30 days. And so let's go ahead and look at the calendar now and let's see what we have. Yep. Yeah, let me, thank you. Let me take a look at the calendar. One, two, three. Uh, let me ask the parties, as far as your schedule on August 24th, uh, how do your schedules look on August 24th? That's a Thursday at 9 a.m. I'm recovering from back surgery, so I'm pretty pretty free. Okay, Ms. Fike? That's that's fine with me as well. Okay, we'll set it for that day. And then um, the guardian ad litem, it was mentioned Ms. Larson, and was she, do the parties know if she was formally discharged from the case? She told no. us that this was her last case and that she was retiring, so I have no idea. She's she was never discharged, but I don't believe that she is um, doing child of litem work still. But right. she is still technically, I think when I the last when I reached out to her, she said that she is still on the on the case. She, Yeah, I don't think she's been formally discharged. And I think she's no longer on the uh, guardian ad litem, what we call the registry. So she's not accepting new cases. So um, Madam Clerk here has a list of the next three available guardian ad litems. Each party has the opportunity to strike or get rid of one of the guardian ad litem that have been presented. So we'll get, the, I'll give you that list. And then each of you can tell me what your thoughts are as far as uh, what your preferences are as far as striking. Oh, the review, uh, 24th of August. Next three names are Twyla Corey. Okay, Twyla Corey. Keith Lawrence. Keith Lawrence. And Heather Kale. And Heather, last name? Kale is K-A-H-L. And Heather Kale. So those are the, the three proposed. Um, so with Ms. Ms. Fike, you're the petitioner. Uh, do you want to strike any one of those three? I mean, no. Maybe the second one. Keith Lawrence. Yeah. Okay, we'll strike him. And then um, Mr. Sorensen, any of the remaining two, uh, Twyla Corey or Heather Call. Um, I don't know any of these, so no, not really. Yeah, it's it's kind of operating in a vacuum. It's difficult. Uh, so generally, it's it's a it's a hierarchical order uh, in which they're listed. So Twyla Corey is first, and then Mr. Lawrence was stricken, and then Ms. Call was listed. So I'll appoint Twyla Corey as the guardian ad litem. Um, she will be reaching out to the parties, and it's important that the parties respond to her promptly. I, I think it's that there's a brief packet that she'll have you fill out. Uh, but the sooner you can get in touch with her, the better, uh, so we can uh, move this along. Um, so, uh, and then as far as the the payment, uh, let me ask: um, Was Ms. Corey was was she was she court 
Was she paid by the court or was she paid by the parties? Um, Londa, I, I, I think I, I had to pay. And we each paid, paid half. You each paid half. Okay. But I believe that hers, hers was waived. No, it was not. Okay. But regardless. Okay. So, so what I'll do, it'll be a 50, 50 split as far as the payment. Um, and then, uh, so she'll get that order. She'll be in cut contact with both parties and you'll have opportunity to chime in and, and uh, Christopher will have opportunity to chime in. And I will uh, draft up an order of uh, memorializing today's uh, rulings on the motions and uh, get that out to the parties. Uh, do you both have access to Odyssey? Yeah. I think so, yeah. Okay. That's where you can access the case file and look at all the pleadings that have been filed. So I'll, I'll file it there and the parties are welcome to, to look in there and, and take a look of, of the order. And can you um, spell Twyla's name? Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, Twyla is T W Y L L A. And Corey, last name is C O R R I E. Perfect. Thank you. Um, let me check with the parties before we end uh, today's session. Mr. Sorensen, do you have any final items? I don't believe so, Your Honor. Okay. Ms. Fike, any final items? No. Okay. All right. I appreciate both parties' time and input, uh, and uh, that will conclude today's hearing, and then we'll see everybody on August 24th at 9 a.m. for the Guardian Lightroom Report related to a residential schedule. Okay. All right. Thank you. Thank you. Okay. That marks. All right. I think that takes us to the Hall and Sorensen matter. This is 19-3-0-0-3-9-3-0-8. All right. And Ms. Corey, are you on that matter? I am. All right. Very good. Okay. Um, so let's see. I have a contempt filed by Mr. Sorensen. So I'm going to address the um, I'm going to have you go ahead and make argument regarding the contempt, sir, and then um, and then we'll talk about the adequate cause um, next. So um, go ahead. I have had an opportunity to read all the documents in this case. I um, appreciate that you both file documents and materials. Um, sir, why don't you tell me what you want me to know about the contempt? Um, the parenting plan, Section 8, Part B, has been broken um, since she's withholding our child rejecting visitation after Christopher fled from my house um, to Miss Fike's sisters during our parenting time. She is in violation of the week on week off schedule. She refused to bring him home to me or comply with police officers to bring him to me or to cooperate as a parent in any way to communicate, discuss our current situation. As you can see from the text that I had filed. Um, section 14 under restrictions was also violated where she discussed the residential schedule with our son outside of already agreed upon parenting plan. She discouraged our son to not attend and led him to believe it should be his choice. He came under the impression his mother hates the ruling set forth by Judge Evans um, and that she is not the one making him come to my house, that it was a stranger making these choices for him. It is my understanding that section 14 exists because Christopher benefits if he is under the impression that both parents are on the same page with respect to the current plan, he should be under the impression that the courts are looking out for what is best for him. It would benefit transition day to see both parents be supportive of one another in front of him. The opposite happened by not setting a positive example of the transition. I believe it set stage for our son to flee. Our child was not in any way in danger, harmed, neglected, or suffering. After our son sneaking out, she had no legal right to keep him away from me. Christopher's trans transition to my house was well planned, including therapy sessions, church, a basketball camp, and re re unification counseling. He had everything in place for a smooth transition, but uh, it was it was stolen from him. So, when is the last time you had your son in your care? The twenty second of June. August. Okay. Hold on. So it's August now. So I mean, yeah, June. Sorry. I'm okay. sorry. Okay. So June 22nd and you haven't had your son in your care since then. No. Okay. Have you had phone contact with him since then? Um, I've tried to reach out to him um, via text 
and I, I haven't received anything from them back. Okay. Thank you. Um, so I'm going to handle these one at a time. Um, I might make my decision all at the end, but I want to kind of do one operation at a time. Um, Ms. Corey, tell me about your involvement in this case. Um, so I see old orders in this case, or old GAL reports, but I don't see a current and I don't see an order appointing you. So tell me how you uh, entered the case. So I was appointed, um, I believe about three weeks ago. I okay. believe it was by Judge Evans and there have been, it's been kind of a comedy of errors. I have not yet gotten an order appointing. Okay. Um, so, uh, but because there was a very quick turnaround and uh, Judge Evans was looking for um, an initial review next week in this case, mm -hmm. I went ahead and got started and sent things, sent intakes out to the parties, how they filled them out. I've interviewed both of the parties so far, but um, because I don't have that order appointing yet, I'm just kind of stuck at this point. Okay, very good. That that makes perfect sense to me. Um, so I appreciate that. Have you been able to talk with the child of the case? Not yet. I um, Because it's um, outside of the school year and I like to speak with the children in a new, more neutral place than one of the homes, um, I have been, uh, I, I believe I have a place to do that secured. So I'll be setting that up soon. Okay, very good. I appreciate that. All right, Ms. Hall, um, what would you like to say about the contempt? I am Ms. Fike. I've been married over a year now. Sorry about the paperwork, but my last name is Fike. Okay, um, so when you name yourself on the screen, Go ahead and name yourself Ms. Fike instead of Ms. Hall. And that's certainly helpful to the court giving you the correct uh, name. Okay. I didn't see my name on here at all. <laughs> okay. Um, so on June 25th, my son refused to go to his father's house due to mental and emotional issues that we've been going on for years as of the other court papers. Um, we were, we had a court date July 20th. Um, that was when uh, Ms. Corey was appointed to us to to figure out why he refused to go to his house and figure out what the issues really are. Judge Evans said she he appointed Twyla for Christopher's voice. He ordered Christopher to go to his dad's July 21st that next day on Friday. So he's seen his son at the end of July, not June. Um, Christopher went to his dad's. Well, his dad showed up. Christopher took off down the street. His dad went after him. They ended up leaving together after they talked. Um, just for me to get a call the next morning that he ran away from his dad's house. Um, talking to the cops, they never told me to bring him back. They said they understood and to keep him safe. So I don't know what he's meaning, what the cops said to him, but what the conversations with the cops for, with me were totally different. And they were aware of the court. They're aware of the guardian ad litem. So for me to try to keep my son safe and why he's trying to, why he's refusing and running away from his father's house. I want those things to be addressed. I'm not withholding Christopher. I'm not keeping him from his dad. If he goes there again, what if he runs away again? So I, I'm trying to think of down the line. No, I'm not withholding him at all. Christopher refused. Christopher ran away from his father's house. And I feel like knowing all the stuff that's been going on for years, and I can't force him to go, especially he's six foot two. I'm not going to physically force my child to go. Yes, he needs, we need to figure out why he's not wanting to go and people to listen, but I am definitely not withholding my son from his father. That's the whole reason why Miss Corey is here to, you know, I can't wait for her to talk to him. So does your son have a cell phone? He does. And he has it currently? Yes. Has he been in the last month um, visiting with friends? Yes. Um, going places? Mostly my sisters because I work and him and his cousin Ashton are best friends. Uh, this whole summer, he's been to four different friends' houses on my time. Four times this whole entire summer. So yes, he has. What school district are you in? He was starting his freshman year this year. All right. 
Thank you. He had his first uh, counseling appointment with Core Health on August 1st. He had his second one um, the, on the 15th, just two days ago, with Core Health as well. So he is in did counseling. You provide the, did you provide the father with the information regarding the dates and times of the appointments? No, but they were verbally said in court what time they were. Did you provide the father with the name of the counselor? No, because I just found out the name of the counselor just last week because we did the intake with a lady named Linda. And we I just met Hannah, which her name is Hannah from Core Health. I don't know her last name. Um, on the 15th is when we met her. Does your child have a diagnosis? Not yet. No, he's, they're setting up another um, counseling for this afternoon and hopefully next week. Okay. How many times have you taken the child in the car and taken him to his father's house since that last July visit? He hasn't, he hasn't been to his father's house. Right. I'm asking since if you put the child in the car and drove him over to dad's house. Oh, I have not. Have you dialed up dad on the phone? handed the phone to child and said, you need to talk to dad. No. Okay. All right. We're also before the court on the issue of adequate cause. Um, so ma'am, you filed those uh, documents asking for adequate cause to modify the parenting plan. Um, what would you like me to know about that? Um, the reason why I want to modify is because of his refusal and not wanting to go. I want him to see his father. I want him to be able to have that relationship with him. But there's also something going on there that we need to figure out. Okay. Sir, what would you like me to know about adequate cause? Um, well, I mean, this has already been proven that there was no adequate cause um, in the, with by Mr. Evans. Um, I just, I don't really, I, as of right now, there. I mean... Other than since he's been in Miss Fike's care for the last few months, I've been receiving countless. He's been sneaking out, um, running. He ran, ran away from my house. He's cut himself off of all um, of his encouraging friends and relatives. Um, that's that's really that's where I'm at. I see. Yeah, yeah, you... the point with Twyla, um, to figure out what's going on. So with, with that being said, I feel like Mr. Evans, Judge Evans, excuse me, in a way, not believed, but believed there's something going on that he said guardian item to be Christopher's voice. So I don't understand. I, we get two different aspects when of what. Was that, when was that hearing held? July 20th was our last court date with him refusing to go to his dad's. I'm just looking for the clerk's minutes. Okay, here we go. So did the court just put it on today for review? Cause it sounds like the court previously found contempt. So the court so found contempt is... on the, the, on the, on July 20th, the court found the contempt uh, denied adequate cause, will sign the order, and court appoints guardian ad litem. Initial review next week. So this is your second contempt, sir? Yes, ma'am. Okay. So I was just clarifying, because it looked like when I initially prepped for today, it looked like because there wasn't, um, I didn't have that note as far as the adequate cause being decided. I did see the second contempt. Okay. So then we're just on for those two things. Um, and then uh, Ms. Corey, what I'm, what I'm going to do today before I leave is to issue an order for you <laughs> so you. that you will have that today. And I will ask my clerk to send that um, or my JA to send that out so that you get a copy of it and can start executing on it. Um, did the court set uh, financial obligations or no? To your knowledge. I do not recall. I believe it was private pay. Okay, that's fine. I'm going to do private pay and I'm just going to make the parties 50-50 um, at this point for your services. Um, we'll keep it on next week um, for that um, for that review. And then give me just one moment. So that, that's already been done. Okay. 
Okay. And so, sir, I just want to clarify, when is the last time that you saw your son was so July? Yes, ma'am. When he was, he was ordered to come to my house for the, the fall the Friday, which, um, he didn't want to give me any lost time or anything, but we were supposed to resume the, the regular parenting plan of week on week off. And then he fled, fled my house that next morning. And then I haven't seen him since. Just one moment. Other than that short little window that I did ha receive him, it's almost been, it's been nearly 60 days since I've had my son, which is, I mean, we, you know, I've never been more than a week. Yep, give me just one more. And ma'am, it's your testimony that I saw there was a, a statement from the child and it's your testimony that that was the child statement that you asked him to write. Absolutely not. No. On June 25th, Christopher was supposed to go to his dad's at 8 p.m. that night, and he calls me in there a little before 6, says, Mom, what would happen if I refuse to go to my dad's? I don't want to go. I'm, I'm tired of everything. So we talked, in, uh, talked to him about it and what would happen, and he said, I'm also writing a letter. He was in the middle of typing that, that said letter, and he said he wants me to read it when he's done writing it. So, no, I did not make him write. I didn't tell him to write. I didn't. There was a surprise that he was not necessarily a surprise because he's never wanted to go to his dad's, but he's always went. He's never refused. He's never ran away. I feel like there's something going on because nobody's listening. There's something going on over there of why he refused and right. why he's running Thank away. You. You've answered my question. All right, folks. I appreciate everyone being here today. Um, I appreciate Ms. Corey being here today. I am going to find contempt. Um, I am going to find contempt. I'm going to enter a civil sanction of $1,000. Um, I'm finding that the mother is able to follow the court orders, but is not willing um, that you are intentionally defying the court's orders. Um, I'm also making a separate finding that the mother is directly involving the child in the court process and that you are encouraging the child to disobey and making no effort to follow the court's orders. Here's the That's reality. No, nope. this is where I this is where I talk. I've given everyone a chance to talk and I've listened. When I read the court file, here's my take. If I was making a decision on adequate cause today, I'd make that finding and I would transfer full custody to father. That's your risk, ma'am. What you're doing right now, you are fully aware of what you're doing. You are deciding that you are going to disobey the court order. You're not encouraging your kid to go. You're allowing your child to believe he has some kind of say. He does not. This is a parental decision. And if the two of you can't make that decision, it's the court's decision on where your kid's going to live. Your court, your child is more important than ownership. And what I see in this case file is ownership. Is somebody wanting to possess that child, own that child, but not parent that child. Um, and that is a huge concern for the court. When I see these nice text messages between child and stepmom, and then you telling kid, you don't even have to answer her. You don't have to go to that sports game. That's ridiculous. A, when you tell a child, especially a young teenager, you don't have to respect that adult. You know what that translates to? I don't have to respect mom. I don't have to respect dad. I don't have to respect my teachers. I don't have to respect the court. I can blow all of that on all those people off. So when you think that you're just telling, oh, you can disrespect kind of stepmom, that's not what's happening. You're telling that child he can disrespect everyone. That is terrible for that child. You have four years left with this young man before he is launching off to adulthood and you are setting him on a course for disaster because you are setting him up to think that he can just disobey everyone. And that is not how school works. It's not how the world works. And that's gonna be a harsh reality for him. When you do those types of things, it is so damaging. And especially when what I see on the other side is folks being loving and caring. Look, teenagers are hard. They are hard work. Um, they are not easy. Sometimes they are just going to be um, disobedient and annoying and frustrating 
But that's where you as parents come in and you need to step up and say, you have to go to your dad's. It's your dad's time. You're going. And what you're doing right now is he's on his phone. He's playing his little games. He's going to his friend's houses. That all sounds like he gets to do what he wants. And you're teaching him that instead of follow the court order. It's at the end of the day, it's you that are going to pay the penalty for this, not the child. Um, It's you that risks losing all custody of your child. I honestly had notes on whether or not there needed to be a pause in any contact with you, ma'am, before, and the child needed to be with dad and no contact with you for a period of time. That's how serious I take these orders. That's how serious the court takes orders as far as parenting time. So this idea that kid gets to be on his phone, dinking around, watching TV, eating snacks, all while you are fully aware he's disobeying the court order and you're disobeying the court order, that is not acceptable. Um, And you need to think long and hard about your course of action because you're going down a course of action that I don't think you're going to like the outcome. So at this point, I'm signing the contempt. Ma'am, I highly recommend that you ensure child goes on his visit with his dad. And it's not a visit. Child needs to go to dad for his dad's residential time. Dad is an equal parent here. Um, And everyone needs to realize that and get on board really quickly. Um, Because at this point, the court hasn't found adequate cause. But I think the court essentially is reserving that issue and it can go the other way. Um, The court can find adequate cause and award father full custody. Um, So that is the risk here. So I encourage everyone here to really quickly get on board with getting child to both houses as ordered. There should be no further deviations. Um, Child starts school in what, a week and a half. Um, The idea that we're going to play this game as child starting his um, high school career is ridiculous. Um, Everyone needs to get on board with what the child needs um, and stop sort of playing these games. Um, Encourage relationships with both sides. Um, Stop alienating father and father's family. That is not helpful to that child. You should be thankful and grateful for every adult that wants to be, every positive adult that wants to be involved in your child's life um, instead of trying to encourage your kid to blow them off um, and uh, ruin that relationship. That's not healthy. Um, it's damaging. So um, I'm making a uh, finding of contempt. I'm setting the matter over for one week. Um, everyone needs to um, communicate with Ms. Corey um, any time that she, any documents she asks for, any materials she asks for, Um, Any access she asks for to anyone, everyone needs to be Johnny on the spot with that. Um, And then Ms. Corey, I I don't think the court's expecting a written report from you. Um, I think an oral report will be just fine, um, uh, given the sort of limited nature of your ability to chat with everybody um, and the court not getting that order entered. Thank you. All right. Um, So I've made myself very clear. Um, It is my expectation that that young man will be exercising his regular time for the court order Best of luck to you all. We'll see you here next week. All right, that's going to take us to uh, Hall and Sorensen. And I did see uh, Ms. Corey on the line. There you are. Uh, welcome. And then um, do I have Ms. Tiffany Hall? All right. Oh, Tiffany uh, Fife. That's right. Thank you. Uh, and Mr. Sorensen. Yes. I Perfect. I see you there. All right, Ms. Corey, go ahead. Um, Well, I have had the opportunity thus far to meet with both of the parents um, and uh, and the child. Um, I really have no recommendations beyond the original parenting plan at this point. I believe we should move forward with with that in place as it is um, and uh, go from there. Thank you, Ms. Corey. I appreciate your report. All right. Um, next, I'm going to turn uh, the time to you, um, Ms. Fike. Um, at this point, um, the Guardian Alliance recommendation is to maintain the current parenting plan, um, at least until she can further her investigation. Um, would you like to speak to that, Ms. Fike? Yeah, I mean, she's that's great that she wants to keep it the same and wants to further this investigation. I feel like that's a great idea for her to continue her investigation. Okay. Thank you. Um, Mr. Sorensen, go ahead. Um, I feel the same. Um, 
the only thing other thing that I would like to request is maybe if we could apport um, a third third party communication outlet like my family wizard <clears throat> or something like that. Um, me and Miss Spike just can't seem to um, communicate very well, even via t text messages. So I think that would be a good outlet for us to, to utilize. All right. Uh, Ms. Spike, any opinion on using our family wizard or a similar parenting app? I've never had issues with text messages other than him not responding to my text messages. So, I mean, I feel like text messages as well as the wizard app, I think it'll be the exact same. So, I mean, I, I'm not, I'm not sure. Give me just one moment. Uh, Mr. Sorensen, has the child began uh, following the current parenting plan? Yes. Yes, we had a really good week this week. Okay. All right. All right. Uh, thanks, folks. I'm glad to hear parenting plans getting back on track um, and the guardian ad litem is getting on, um, uh, getting online. Thank you, Ms. Corey, for um, being so quick. I know that was a very, very fast turnaround. Uh, so I appreciate you making that effort. Uh, here's what I'm going to order today. So I'm just going to order that the current parenting plan be maintained. Um, that the uh, GAL investigation um, will continue. Um, the parents, I do want you to use our family wizard. Um, you'll both need to log on today. Um, it just if you Google our family wizard, you'll be able to find it. You both need to pay your own fee for that. The fee is pretty minimal. Um, it does do some uh, sort of housekeeping functions that can be useful to both of you. Um, and it's a good way of sort of managing those communications. Um, you'll each pay your own fee for that service. Um, but again, it's fairly, uh, fairly minimal. Um, Ms. Corey, um, I did set, I believe, a review um, in that guardian ad litem order. Let me just double check. Yes. Oh, no, it says to be determined. So I did not set one. So uh, let's do that today. Um, Ms. Corey, um, when are you looking to be able to complete your investigation? Uh, probably end of October, early November. Okay. And, uh, I also do need to address payment today. Okay. Let's set a date and then we'll address payments. Um, all right. I'm going to say, let's have your report, um, Let's have it ideally no later than November 7th with a review on November 14th. Oh, I'm sorry, not 14th. I'm gonna put this the 16th is the Thursday. All right, so we'll be back here and all parties will need to be back here on November 16th at 9 a.m. Um, again, still via Zoom, so you'll just need to appear um, the same way you got to today. And then Ms. Corey, um, tell me about payment. Uh, no payment received as of yet from either party. Both have indicated that um, it's a hardship for them. Okay, so sir, let's address that with you first. Are you currently employed? Um, I'm currently on um, FMLA. I had back surgery the end of June, so I've been trying to recover from back surgery. I should be getting back to work here hopefully in the next couple of weeks or so, but it's been kind of rough off of FMLA. Okay. Um, and Ms. Fike, as to payment of the guardian ad litem. Um, I told Ms. Corey that I was, because I was told I can get a waiver for her fees because I cannot afford it at all. I had a medical emergency. I was out for a month and a half as well. Um, and I even called the clerk's office because I couldn't find that waiver fee. And they even helped me look. The administration at the clerk's office helped me look for that. And they told me to address that in court that we can't find the waiver fee for her um, fees. Okay. Well, I just appointed her last week, so um, I don't think anything's been submitted for that. If there was previous waivers in the file um, for like a prior GAL or a prior fee, that wouldn't necessarily translate to the waiver for Ms. Corey's fees. Um, how long ago was your medical emergency? It was all through June, July. Okay. Are you working? 
I just got back to work. Yes. All right. Uh, how much do you make per hour? 20. Okay. Here's what I'm going to do. I'm going to transfer this to um, county pay. Um, so I am going to have the county pay, but I am going to make that, um, Ms. Corey, um, to be reviewed um, because it sounds like both parties had some sort of issues that happened pretty, uh, pretty recently, um, but that those issues would likely be resolved by the time we get to um, the hearing um, in November. Um, so what that means, folks, is that the county is essentially going to pay Ms. Corey up front. Um, the expectation, though, is that you may need to reimburse um, or pay additional funds to Ms. Corey at the end. Um, so don't assume that that means that you're, you know, sort of don't have any obligation going forward. Um, it's just that the court's going to um, allow payment um, of Ms. Corey directly from the court initially. Um, and we're going to review that in November. Um, does that make sense to you, Mr. Sorensen? Yes. Uh, and to you, Ms. Fike? Yes, ma'am. All right. Very good. Um, so with that, um, anything further on this case, Ms. Corey? I don't believe so. All right. Uh, Bra, anything for any other questions from you, Ms. Fike? No, I don't have any more questions. All right. Uh, to you, Mr. Sorensen? No. no. All right. Very good. Uh, thank you both. Um, I think Ms. Corey. I'm, Go I'm ahead. so sorry. I do have a question. Um, Two court dates ago, I submitted um, my mother's hair follicle test. My son hasn't seen her in almost three years. And um, Judge Basher is the one who put that in to where she needed to do that for my son to see her. And I wasn't able to say it either court dates to bring it up again, but it was filed. Can my son see his grandmother? Um, that's not before me today. Um, if you want to address that, you have to file a motion. Um, so that's not before me today. Um, you can file a motion um, and then the court can address that. Okay. So is it just any motion? Because I was told just to submit the paperwork for my court date and that's what I did and it's never been addressed. I didn't know what motion to file. I can't give you legal advice um, because I'm sitting as, uh, as a neutral decision maker. Um, so I can't give either party advice on what to do or what to file. Um, so I invite folks to speak to legal aid. Um, you can hire an attorney even just for a consult to get advice. Um, you can look online and there's lots of options um, for you, but I can't direct you specifically on what to do. Okay. Okay, uh, appreciate that. All right, with that, I am gonna sign an order that just reflects uh, my rulings today. Um, and makes it clear uh, for the next judicial officer when we get here um, in November um, to sort of have a good idea on what's happening. All right. Thank you both. Um, that concludes this matter. Okay. Sounds like it might be on our end. All right. Mr. Sorensen, can you hear me? Yes, sir. And... Uh, I see a Tiffany Fike. Is that uh, formerly Tiffany Hall? Yeah, it's Tiffany Fike. Okay, and you can hear me as well. Yes, sir. Yeah, pardon me. I forgot to mute my phone when I came in. Okay. All right, Mr. Sorensen, this is on your motion. Anything you wish to say? I've read what you submitted. Um. Yeah, Tiffany violated the order signed by Honorable Commissioner. Um, Baldwin, at our most recent hearing, Commissioner ordered both Tiffany and me to use our family wizard as a means of communi com communication from now on. After court, she ordered both of us to contact our family wizard and pay our portion of the order. I complied immediately. Tiffany did not comply with the order and re later refused. This is Tiffany's third contempt since July. She continues to disregard the court orders. As you can see in her most recent declaration, she blatantly disregards the orders of the court, criticizes and devalues Commissioner Baldwin's qualifications and judgment, complains about her present guardian item, Twyla Corey, tells the court exactly what she will and won't abide by, so you can imagine how she addresses me behind closed doors, which is why the need for the third-party communication outlet is vital in making CRISPR the priority for the few years we have left. We are all doing our best for Christopher, our current GAL Twyla, the judges and commissioners who have assisted us in the case. We are all working diligently to comply with the court orders to ensure fairness and do what is best for Christopher. I'm doing everything in my power and have complied with every order placed and corralled in every way possible. Does not make sense for this case when only one parent is actively working to make Christopher a priority. Tiffany seems to be escalating and creating a worst possible scenarios to impact her son. 
I just request that the courts help me cement a preventative measure and continuing contempt. Ms. Pike, is there anything you wish to say? Yes. Um, my son is my first priority. My first contempt, my son refused to go to his father's. I tried to get court right away. Of course, court dates are always two to three weeks out. I was held in contempt because my son refused to go to his father's. He was ordered to go. He ran away from his father's house. So we did more paperwork, went back to court. I was held in contempt because, again, they were thinking I was withholding my son when he's the one refusing and ran away from his father's. This last contempt or court date, she asked my opinion on the My Family Wizard app. I declined it. I said, there's no need for an app when we've text messaged this. My son's almost 15. We've been using our phone the communication for almost 15 years. And it's never been a problem until he addressed it last court date that it is a problem. And it's not. And I can't I can't afford to pay the guardian ad litem. And they already know that. And I can't pay to download an app on my phone that does something that I already pay for. So I don't feel like I should be held in contempt because for not downloading an app because we communicate just fine during text messages. Well, from looking at the text messages, it's pretty clear that's not the case. I don't understand that. The text messages look pretty, uh, they escalate quickly and a lot of people get obnoxious, don't you think? I believe that's what I put in my declaration, that he was the combative one, and I try okay. to communicate, and then he's always rude to me. Okay. Anything else you want to tell me? No, I think that's it. All right. Mr. Sorensen, anything you want to respond to? Um, as far as the payment, it's it's $99 for a year subscription to, to the app. All right. So, Ms. Fike, this is real simple. There's an order that says you're to both use the family wizard. That's not a suggestion. It's not aspirational. It's a court order. And you have to follow it or you're going to be in contempt. That means if when you're in contempt, you either pay money or you do jail time or there's some other sanction. So here's what we're going to do. You're going to get that Our Family Wizard and you're going to get it immediately. I'm going to continue this matter for one week. Uh, next uh, Thursday, that'll be the 28th at 9 o'clock. If you've got the family wizard, we'll talk about what kind of fine, if any, is going to be imposed because of your failure to get it so far. If you don't have it, the options are a lot more serious. Is there any part of that you don't understand? No. That will be all. Thank you. That will Thanks. Computer program is running very slow. So, ma'am, I put this over today to confirm that you had signed up for the family wizard. Has that happened? Yes, it has. And can you confirm that, Mr. Sorensen? Yes, she signed up for it on Tuesday. All right. Thank you. So, ma'am, I want to make sure you understand if there are violations of the order down the road, it's going to cost you money or worse. So those orders are not suggestions. You understand that? Yes, I do. Okay, then we will leave it there. Tiffany Hall and Joseph Sorensen, like to call that next. Uh, Tiffany Hall, are you on the line today? I'm here. All right, welcome, Ms. Hall. And Joseph Sorensen, are you here today? Yes, Your Honor. Okay, welcome. All right, so we're on today for a pretrial for a trial of a on a modification of a parenting plan that's set for the week of January 22nd this year. Um, and we also have a readiness hearing on the 16th of January at 11:30 that will determine this precise date during the week of the 22nd that the trial will be heard. So as far as pretrial, um, pretrial generally is a time in which the, it's a time of preparation to make sure that everything is ready for the trial and that all information has been exchanged between the parties, documents, witnesses, uh, contact information of witnesses has been provided. 
So let me just touch base with the parties. Uh, Ms. Hall, uh, do you have an idea of what, what individuals you may call as witnesses during the trial? I do, I have about four. Okay, and have you provided those names in the phone number to Mr. Sorensen? No, I have not. Okay. I thought that's what we do here is voice it to you guys. So I, I wasn't sure how to, okay. <laughs> sure, I mean, you could do it one of two ways. Uh, you know, doing it verbally here is, is helpful, uh, but sometimes some things are lost in the translation, if you will, and that's why the written word sometimes it works a little bit better. So, so those four individuals, who are those four individuals? It'd be my husband, Joseph Fike. Okay. My father-in-law, Ed Fike. Okay. My sister, Haley Gomez. Haley Gomez, okay. Gomez, and my mother, Jill Hall. Jill Hall. All right. Mr. Sorensen, any questions related to those witnesses that were potential witnesses? No, Your Honor. Okay. And I'll, I'll ask the same question to you, Mr. Sorensen. Do you have, who are the individuals who will, who may be potential witnesses at trial? Um, I'm not, I'm not calling on any witnesses. Okay. So you just, just yourself? Yes. Sir. Okay. All right. Then let me ask the parties, the main contention or the issue to be solved at trial, Ms. Uh, Ms. Fike, can you tell me what that is? I'm so sorry. Can you repeat that? You cut out. Sure. sure. At the trial that's coming up in the, in the, near the end of January, what's the main issue in your mind that needs to be resolved, that needs to be sorted out? Um, the reason why my son refused and ran away from his father's house. I want to get down to the bottom of what's going on over at his dad's house and why he doesn't want to be there. Okay. So the issue of parenting plan and, and time frames and the like and figuring out why. Yeah. Okay. And Mr. Sorensen, what's, what's your impression of what's to be resolved or presented at that trial? Um, of changing the parenting plan the, the, that we have in place right now. Okay, all right. Uh, oftentimes people will come to court and they will have uh, documents that they want the court to review and be part of the evidence that's presented. Do either of you have any, any documents either from financial institutions or from counselors or guardians ad litem or evaluators that you want the court to consider? Um, I submitted Chris, my son's uh, counseling records. I don't know if you need to talk to his counselor or not. I'm not sure how that works. Generally, generally at a trial, the individuals need to be called as witnesses to testify as to the, what their personal knowledge is of a particular issue. So if a counselor, uh, you want the court to know about that counselor, then you'd need to call them as a witness. If there's no objection to the records being considered from the other side, then the court can consider those records. Uh, but if they object, then you would rely upon the, the verbal testimony of the witness to get that information in. Okay. So that's something to, to consider is that if you have documents that you want to have admitted, you can ask the other party. You can look under a rule, it's called evidence rule 904 that you can use that rule to say, hey, these are the documents I want to have considered during the trial. And you can send those documents to the other party and have them look over them. If they object, then the court will rule on it at, the, at trial. If they don't object and they say that's okay, then those would be admitted and considered during the trial. So that's something you might want to take a look at and, and file an, uh, what they call an ER. 904 submission or an evidence rule 904 and you can look that up online so oh, okay. as far as the paperwork that i have already filed do i need to refile that as for everything that i've filed up to this point so declarations for if, evidence yeah if you have your own declarations you can testify uh, and cover that information with your verbal testimony if you have other documents that are come from a third party uh, you, you may give consideration to uh, having those submitted through the ER 904 process or uh, calling that individual as a witness during the trial. Okay. Ms. Corey, I saw you turned your camera on. Yes. Um, if neither party is calling me as a witness, I can strike this from my calendar. 
Let me hear from the parties. Ms. Fike, Ms. Corey has indicated that you've, you've indicated that you're not planning on calling Ms. Ms. Corey as a witness. Is that accurate? Yeah, that's accurate. Okay. And Mr. Sorensen, do you plan to call or potentially call Ms. Corey as a witness? Um, I, I would actually would like to call on Ms. Ms. Corey as okay. a potential witness. Okay. Um, then at this point, I would like to ask for um, my typical fee for trial, and that is two hours trial prep and one hour trial testimony. Okay. That's fine. Would you, do, is that an order that you could just briefly uh, submit via email and I could sign off on it? Or is that something I could just do a bench order? A bench order would be fine. Okay, so let me just give myself a, a little note here. And that would be two hours prep time, one hour trial time, and, and what's the rate? 150. Thank you. I'll prepare that order and submit that. Thank you. All right. Um, in, in, so thinking about the trial, just any, any additional items or questions, Ms. Fike, that you have in preparation for the trial that you would like to clarify here today? I don't think so. Okay. Mr. Sorensen? Um, other than, so um, she's kind of, she's threatening to go against what our residential schedule is now. Um, so if I was to file another contempt, it would more likely be granted outside of the trial. Is that something that could be brought into this trial, if that was the case? So at a trial, you're welcome to raise any issue you'd like to that you feel is relevant to the issues to be resolved. The court or the, the judge that's hearing the case uh, may say that's okay, may say that's not okay to bring in uh, alleged contemptuous behavior. Uh, some, some, some people will file a separate motion based on an allegation of a contempt, and that could be heard separately from the trial. So it's, it's not certain whether the judge would allow you to bring that evidence into the trial. She, she may, she may not. Okay, thank you. Okay. Any other questions in preparation for the trial? Oh. Okay. All right. Thanks for your patience. Thanks for joining us today. We'll, we'll next see you all on January 16th at 1130 for the readiness hearing. Thank you. All right. Thank you.